going to talk Astros in a second, but I just just think about it. Like when the Astros and the Cubs both started their reclamation projects the same year, Theo Epstein, Jeff Luno, and the Cubs have gone through so many administrations, and now they have a new manager in Craig Council. The Astros are, are are still winning from that original window that was built back then. It's amazing. It truly is amazing that they've been the class of the American League for a long time. And BK, I don't see it slowing down. I really don't. Uh, I'll be honest. I, I'm. I thought I saw it slowing down last year. Then they made it to the ALCS. And they seem to have a nice formula going on over there. It's just going to be about – they have some big decisions coming up. We're going to see where it goes. They do indeed, including Alex Bregman. But let's start with another superstar on their roster. Not quite ready to go. Take a look at this. Justin Verlander said he's a couple of weeks behind his expected schedule. This from Brian McTaggart, MLB.com. And saying, when I first started playing catch, I usually shut it down for a while. And this time when I shut it down and picked the ball back up, my shoulder didn't feel so great. So I kind of had to take a step back. Again, Verlander turns 41 next week. Remember last year, he missed the first five weeks of the season for the Mets. Here's Verlander himself. I'm a little bit behind schedule right now. I had a little hiccup early on that's resolved itself. But I have to be really cautious with how I'm building up. I guess my body doesn't respond the same at 40 as it does at 25. So, you know, I'm a couple weeks behind. So when I first started playing catch, I usually shut it down for a while. And this time when I shut it down and picked the ball back up, my shoulder didn't feel so great. Um, so kind of had to take a step back and just kind of like really be diligent about my buildup. I've always been somebody who luckily could just pick up a ball and start throwing it. And this time wasn't quite as easy. I've always liked to give myself as much rest as possible. So my timeline is always a little tight. So with a tight timeline, having to slow things down a little bit, a little bit behind. I mean, it seems all pretty reasonable. He's in his age 41 season, gutted out three starts in the playoffs for Houston last year. He pitched 162 innings, a 3-2-2 ERA. Now, what is expected of Verlander and the Astros? Pakoda, this is from Baseball Prospectus, their projections, notoriously conservative. So 95 is a big number to expect. Hey, 95 wins are expected from the Astros this year. Jake, let's start with this. You're about the same age as Justin Verlander. You're already in a suit. So your thoughts on him <laughs> pitching on into his 40s? Well, look, I, I, this is no surprise to me. When we saw Justin have the year he had coming off Tommy John, you know, and it's why I expect some big years off some, some Tommy John guys. When you sit back for a year and a half, rest and recover and build up, you can come back and do special things but we saw after that year he started on the DL got himself right but pitched late into the postseason ALCS starts those are high pressure situations a lot of taxi and look and you heard him say it he shut it down picked the ball back up and his shoulder didn't feel good the big news for me is he said it's resolved he's just a little bit behind schedule for me a 41 year old that's going to start a little slower it's okay especially with the depth that 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 uh, J.P. France is dealing with some injuries. I know they got McCullers and, and Garcia also going to start on the I.L. But this team, you see, projected at 95 wins, they're going to be just fine. Look, in this day and age, and maybe I'm just following, it's mostly like the Dodgers model. Like when you have an older guy, you're not worried about the innings in April and May. You're already an elite team, right? So they're thinking Verlander, uh, he's going to be pitching the whole season. But mainly you want excellent innings in August, October. September, October, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. That's, that's what they're looking for. And, and to your point, JP, it's all about that depth that they have. First of all, they have Framber and Christian Javier behind him. Both of them had, I would say, a little bit of a down year last year, particularly Javier. Um, you know, but that was kind of his first real full season as a starter. So making some adjustments. Hunter Brown, we saw some really nice flashes of. This kid looks like he's going to be very good at the big league level. And then that depth. J.P. France, Jose Urquidy, you can even go, Bilac was really big for them at times last year. They've got the depth that they need, and it's going to be about managing those innings throughout the course of the season to make sure that Verlander is ready come October. Yeah, they won 90 games last year. They lost in the ALCS in seven games to Texas. Obviously, can go either way. Uh, but take a look at where the Astros have been over the last decade. We're talking seven straight appearances in the league championship series, which I think is really, if I was to pick one like um, you know, barometer of success I would say that because a lot of flukish things can happen you win a World Series you don't you get you win a pennant you don't but making it to the LCS the top teams do that and over the last 10 years if you look at that number kind of in the middle that's the biggest number a seven 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 in the last 10 seven straight even the mighty Dodgers who have more postseason appearances in the last 10 all 10 years right five Pennants, they've won three. Astros have won four. World Series titles, Astros have won two. Dodgers have won one. They're the only club to have won two in the last decade. Uh, so look at that. Uh, most consecutive LCS appearances. You got the Braves of the 90s, the Astros presently. And I would maintain it's harder to do it now, Jake. 
It's, this is an era of super teams. The teams that are all in or all in teams get out and they get out of the way. I think it's harder to be a super team and actually get that far now. The question is, is the window still open for them? You're thinking that, no, they can still like maintain their excellence, which is very difficult. I, I do. I think Jordan Alvarez is as big of a bat as we have in the league, and his presence is going to be felt there, and everybody else gets to fall in. You just signed Altuve. We've got Bregman, I know, coming up, and you got Tucker that you got to deal with. Big mm -hmm. number guys, but, but those guys stay in place. But when I start looking at the young catcher that they have that they're about to develop, Jeremy Pena is going to take a step forward, I believe, big-time defender. and doesn't have to hit because of everybody else in the lineup hitting. Chaz McCormick taking a huge step forward. Dubon, utility role. I love this team from top to bottom. I, I really do. The question for me is if that bullpen continues to remain as strong as they, they have been in years mm. past. They tried to address that with Presley and, and, excuse me, Hader to go with Presley. I don't see this window closing. I, I, there's no way Tucker or, or Bregman, if not both, are staying in Houston. One of the two is with that core, Altuve, they're championship, they're, they're winners up and down. Uh, I just can't see them going anywhere. For the That's time. what it comes down to. You've got these pieces that are coming up on, you know, uh, they're coming up on free agency. Are we going to be able to keep them long term or even short term, whatever that may be, whatever it looks like? Because uh, there's not a ton in their minor league system right now ready to, to replace them. And I think that's the biggest key. So it's where can you go? And I think what you saw from them this offseason was, well, we don't have necessarily the money or the ability to go out and get a starter, a front line, another starter. So let's go ahead and fortify our bullpen, which was already a huge strength of this team. And now they made it even stronger. Those are the kinds of decisions that can help you figure out ways to maximize and increase the amount of time that you're going to be able to be at the highest level and compete at the highest level. When you go out and get Hader to go with Presley and Abreu, you're looking at a, a back end of that bullpen that's phenomenal. Right. And now those starters that we just talked about where they have good depth don't have to go as far into games. That means something because they have a nice back end of the bullpen to take those innings off of them. So it's that kind of outside of the box thinking and building a team. As long as they continue to keep doing that, that will keep this window open for as long as possible. Well, Verlander's money is coming off the books next year that would allow them to mm -hmm. free up the money. Depending on the, he's got the, you know, he's got that um, vesting option, I think, right? If he, 140 mm -hmm. innings. If he pitches 140 innings this year, then he's going to be back on the books again next. Okay, wow. Yeah. They are, and even when you're throwing it around, you're mentioning it, you have to go like six or seven names deep, and we're barely get into it. Yeah, they, they're, they've kept Jose Altuve, and the top teams keep their franchise players, and he's a franchise player. When we do top ten right now, and you do relief pitchers with us, and we do the top ten players at each position, uh, there's, we, we can look at it a number of ways. We always do, we do this weighted, Houston's on top, or just looking at it purely from most players on the top ten per position. Houston is number one. One. Right now, the Braves are there, obviously, but you're talking, these are the superpowers at the very top. And yet, you know, Houston is right there with eight. It's the depth and it's the excellence. All right, meantime, you mentioned Josh Hader uh, is in the business now. He is in the bullpen. He comes in a five year, $95 million deal. Where will he pitch? I think we had a general idea of where that might be, but that was solidified today. I think I feel more comfortable, um, you know, given Hader that opportunity um, since he has shown um, his ability to do it, but same as Presley, you know, this is just not, Presley's not going to pitch the ninth inning. Presley is as successful as Josh Hader's been in that closer role. So by right, right now, Hader will, will pitch the ninth inning when both guys are available. Yeah, I think ultimately in the game of baseball, uh, roles are very important. Uh, we have routines as, as baseball players, and you know when you're able to get into that routine and, and knowing exactly what you what you have to accomplish, um, it makes the whole outcome of, of baseball games uh, better. You perform uh, better because you know what you what you have to do to accomplish that. It's funny that in in this day and age. Everyone is still comfortable with the with the old 1977 yeah. model yeah. of of like no, they're a closer. That's our last guy. Because look, Ryan Presley has 102 saves over the last four years. An outstanding pitcher. Now Hater's stuff is better, right? His velocity is better. He's more unhittable. Uh, but it's but the eighth inning guy can see more leverage than the ninth inning guy. But there's something to and, and this makes sense. I mean, I think I'm with Joe Espada, Jake, on this. It makes sense. You bring this guy in the big signing. His stuff is better. He is more comfortable working the ninth. You just say, you're the closer, quote, unquote. 
and Ryan Presley will now roam setup, which can be an extremely important role, maybe the most important role as well. well yeah, I can't imagine. I, yeah, I think this is just what you said, BK. You give somebody $95 million, you need to let that guy close and just to keep his mindset there. But Presley has been every uh, has been as good over the last few years and done it in the postseason, mm -hmm. which Hater has. So uh, to me, it's exciting to think about having your former closer available to get out of a big spot the sixth, seventh, eighth. Right. But but what I would fight back on to Julius Spada and go, look, man, I've got two of the most dominant closers that we've got in the game. How in the world are we not sitting on the bench going, okay, uh, you know, it's two lefties due up in the eighth. Let's roam. Let's mix and match. I mean, to Do me, that. that's, yeah. that, that's there's the no that, way yeah. that it's going to make okay. sense at times for right. Presley to face two Three lefties, potentially, right. even. Or if it's hardly order it's in the eighth, eighth and it's lefties and you want Hader in there, and then Presley can finish out the I, game. I, I think, both, I think both of those yeah. guys, I know Josh Hader personally. I don't know Presley. I think they're going to get down there and start to know each other. And, and again, once you've gotten paid like Hader's gotten paid, right. I think that you just are going to get to the point where you will do what the team needs to do. And once some games get blown in there yeah. early, and then, again, postseason is going to be That's the thing. To, to your point, it's about the big game. So you can say, if you're Joe Espada, you can go out here right now in spring training and say, Josh Hader's my ninth inning guy because games haven't even started yet. But when it gets real and it gets to the end of the season and the postseason and things start to change and Seems the matchups up in the mean a little bit more and you've got Schwarber leading off and, and Harper coming up third, you might say something a little bit different. It might be right. – and, and we're talking about in the eighth inning. I might say, you know what, Hater, I might need you in the eighth inning tonight. This is the postseason. This is where we need you. And I don't think there would be an argument. I think that's right. the point you're making. Uh, the other thing is, like you said, Hater got paid uh, – these guys get paid uh, for whatever reason because of saves, even though it should just be on performance in general. He's probably got one more contract that he's looking at. So that would be the other thing that I would say could be in this formula here as far as haters' mentality. I would – Hope not, though, right? I, I hope not. It's a five-year deal. That I is for in this in this volatile era for yeah. relief pitching. It's like no, no. This is this is That's the bite of the apple. Is. This yeah. is what you get. And almost like I look at remember Andrew Miller when he signed his big free agent deal. And they said, "How are you going to be used?" He goes, "They paid me however they want, not to abuse the guy, right? You don't want to say I'm, we're going to put a hundred innings on Josh Hader, but especially given what happened in San Diego last year, isn't this the time to say however the club is going to use me?" Uh, they took care of me. I'll take care of them. Well, that's exactly right. Look, when a team makes the commitment, and you've heard Josh Hader, he wanted to go to Houston because they committed to him. And I look, I think that he's going to give them the same back. I really do think this is going to take some time to figure out. But Josh Hader wants to win a World Series, and he said it out of his own mouth. Went to Houston. I was looking at teams that I felt like I had a, a legitimate chance to punch through and win that title. I think Hader is going to get to to that. Uh, and they'll throw anywhere they need him to throw if it's not the ninth. Yeah. Uh, no, again, uh, we went through through the whole free agency of, uh, like, where he can be used, where he can't. And uh, you would figure at this point it would not be an issue. We don't know if it is at this point.